I was thinking about what to speak on tonight, and I went to one text in Romans 8, and I actually sent that out to the people um, in charge of getting the um, text over to the worship leader. They didn't in this case, but William, you did it again. Your songs were right on target. Is we, we don't need to tell you anymore what to tell I mean, We never did anyway, but we, <laughs> we don't need to tell you. But um, a couple hours later, uh, I just felt the Lord speak to me. And uh, I kept the same topic, but I shifted the text and decided to do it on um, first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 instead. So why don't we look at that text? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 to 5. You'll notice I, I, I emboldened two of the words in the text because I'm going to be looking very carefully at these two words in particular. For while we are in this tent, Paul's talking about the body, the human body. He's calling it a tabernacle. While we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling place. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God. Who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Let's ask God's blessing on this scripture reading this evening. Lord, as we look at this small text, so rich, so powerful, we pray, God, that you will speak to our hearts and remind us again of truths we need to be thinking about, truths that comfort us and that challenge us. We commit this text into your hands, and we open our hearts and our ears to hear from you, knowing that we will never be the same pray that you speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes the fulfillment of the Lord's promise concerning salvation can seem so far away. I'm reminded of Psalm 22.1. Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? I remember when I was a young boy, I can't remember the exact age, I think it was around 9 or 10, my parents had taken me to a graveyard to look at some of the gravestones of relatives who had passed away. I don't mean to get morbid here, but, uh, but I have a point in, in, in this story. And I remember as, you know, 9 or 10-year-old boys are prone to do, I got bored after a while, my parents were looking at some gravestones and talking about memories and things of this nature, and I wasn't part of that, part of the stories that they were telling. So I sort of roamed off on my own, and I started looking around. I recall that there were some very large tombstones that people had set up, very elaborate ones. And some of these tombstones actually described something of that person, who they were, and something of their life. And I remember walking along and reading on the tombstones who these people were and trying, you know, just out of curiosity. And I remember one in particular just really grabbed my attention. Somebody had actually included a photograph of the deceased on the tombstone. It was like a little circle. I remember this very vividly. It was like a little circle. It was a photograph. So I got close to it and I looked and it was a photograph of a boy that looked about my age. And it, it just gripped me. And I remember looking at that thinking, this guy is like me. And he's dead. And it, it just, I couldn't get it out of my mind. I mean, looking back at it now, I think it was the first time that I had really confronted my own mortality. The fact that this body I inhabit <laughs> will not last that it will fail me, that it, there will come a time when I will die and I will be buried and there, will people, there are people who will mourn and who will cry and who will grieve over me. And I just remember thinking about this, the sadness that came over me. 
I didn't know who this boy was. I didn't know why he died so young. But the fact that someone that young could die meant to me at the time that you could die at any time. There was no guarantee about the future. And I just remember thinking about that, lying in my bed at night, thinking about that. Our mortality. In this tent, in this mortal tabernacle that we currently inhabit, we groan for something better. We groan for the fulfillment of a promise. We inherently know that this mortal existence is not all there is, that, that something more was meant for us than being taken from the dust and returning again to the dust. We yearn for the promise of God concerning eternal life. And we know that this eternal life will not just be some ghostly existence floating around somewhere in the heavens, but that but that the fulfillment of God's promises have to do with our total existence, even our bodies. That we will one day attain salvation, not just as souls, but as bodies. That our entire embodied existence will be transformed from mortality to immortality. That one day we will be freed from the sorrows and the pain and the hardship of life in this mortal tabernacle. And yet, the fulfillment of that promise when I was thinking about this as a child didn't seem very near to me. All that I could think of in that moment was my mortality. All, all I could think of in that moment was the sadness of a life taken away at such a young age of my life that could be taken away, of the fact that I live in this world that is filled with loss and grieving. That seemed very real to me at the moment. That seemed overwhelmingly real to me at the moment. But the promise that they talked about sometimes in church of the future resurrection seemed so far away. Sometimes the hope for the resurrection can seem like that, it can seem so far away, so detached from the realm in which we live every day, so far removed from the pains and the sorrows that we experience in this mortal existence. And what this text tells us tonight is there is reason for rejoicing. The resurrection isn't so far away as we might think. In fact, what Paul wants to tell Christians is that the reality of the resurrection, because of the Holy Spirit that is in them, the reality of the resurrection will become even more real than the mortality that you are currently living, even more real than the loss and the pain and the sorrow and the yearning that you experience in this mortal existence, that the hope in the resurrection can be a power that you become aware of in your life that will comfort you and change you, that will encourage you and cause you to rejoice that you can actually live in the resurrection now. That the hope for the future resurrection can be even more real to you in time, even more real to you than the weakness and the suffering of this mortal existence. That's the good news. That's what Paul wants to say. That's the major thrust of this passage. So let's look at it. Paul says, while we are in this tent, and the term he uses in the original language is this tabernacle, this dwelling place. While we are in this tabernacle, we groan. This groaning is like a yearning. It's the kind of groaning that maybe somebody experiencing a certain form of bondage who groans for liberty, who yearns deep within their soul. So we groan for freedom from this mortal 
existence. We are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed. In other words, if we shed this mortal body, we don't want to exist forever just as ghosts. Rather, we want the fullness of the promise. We don't want to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead. This is what our hope is. Not just shedding this mortal body, but taking on a new one taking on the body of the resurrection, taking on the immortal tabernacle, the immortal tent, the immortal dwelling place. But to be clothed instead with our heavenly, and the New Testament talks about the body of the resurrection as a kind of heavenly body because it's immortal because it's not made of earthly matter. That we may be clothed and said with our heavenly tent or tabernacle, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. This mortal existence engulfed, overwhelmed, swallowed up by immortality, the immortal life of the Spirit. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by God's immortal life, the life of His Spirit, engulfed. That's the perfect description of the resurrection. Now, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God. He made us for this purpose. He created us from the dust of the ground, not to return to the dust, but to rise up from the dust into immortal existence. That was God's plan from the beginning. He fashioned us for this purpose. We weren't meant as dust to die and return to the dust. That wasn't God's purpose. That's what we brought upon ourselves. But God fashioned us for a higher purpose. To transcend the dust. To be fashioned in the power of the immortal spirit. To have a bodily existence that is freed from the weakness, the loss, the death, the grieving, the sorrow of this mortal life. God fashioned us for a higher purpose. And then gave us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So let's unpack this even more. This idea of the human body as a tabernacle of God's presence That has a long history to it. In fact, it says in Isaiah chapter 40 that God created the entire universe to be the tent or tabernacle of his dwelling. It says in Isaiah 40 verse 22 that God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent or a tabernacle to live in. God created the entire cosmos to be the dwelling place of his spirit, to be the tabernacle of his glory. And in particular, he made every human body to be a mini tabernacle. He made every human body to be a temple of his dwelling. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, a well-known text, it says that the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God breathed the spirit of life in Adam, and Adam, who was taken from the dust, becomes a tabernacle of God's presence, a living soul that lives from God's spirit and that thrives and flourishes 
in relation to the Spirit of God. Each individual human being was made to be a tabernacle of God's Spirit. Each human being was made for immortality, to show forth the glory of God in their embodied existence, to experience the freedom and sanctity, the joy and liveliness of a life permeated by the Spirit of God, a life showing forth the glory of God's holy presence. Every single human being was created to be like that. But we know what happened, right? Everybody knows. Adam and Eve, they listened to the garden snake. They listened to the serpent. They gave themselves over to sin and death, and they fell beneath a curse. The wages of sin is death. You see, sin is not just breaking God's law. Sin is a denial of life. The life that the law promises. What does it say in the Bible? Obey the law and live. And the life spoken of there isn't just material existence. It's a quality of life. Life given over to God's spirit. Life enjoying the, the goodness of God. Showing forth the glory of God. So when you sin, you're not just breaking a law. You're denying life, and you're giving yourself over to the forces of death. The wages of sin is death. Sin leads to death, not just physical death. That, yes. But physical death is just an outward symptom of a deeper problem, of separation from God. Separation from the life of his spirit. So what is the judgment? Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. From the dust you have been taken and to the dust you shall return. But God didn't leave it there. God made a promise. It's already given for us in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Where God says to the serpent, you will strike the heel of the woman's seed, but he will crush your head. This is what Jesus did on the cross. It's interesting that in Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, it describes the incarnation of the Son of God in human flesh this way. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Jesus' flesh was the tabernacle for the Son, anointed of the Spirit for this purpose. Jesus came to fulfill the purpose of creation. He was the ideal tabernacle of God's presence. He gave himself over to God's holy presence. He went down on the cross took our place, took upon himself our debt, overcame it, rose up by the Spirit of God to be that perfect tabernacle of the Son's presence in the power of the Holy Spirit. There he is, raised and exalted what God purposed for Adam all along. What God purposed for all of us all along. Jesus bore Adam's dust, but he didn't return to the dust. When he died, he rose up and was exalted and bore that immortal body freed by the Holy Spirit. 
sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Mortality overwhelmed by life. This is what we were fashioned for. When you look at the risen Christ, you are looking at the beginning of the new creation. You are looking at the fulfillment that God promised all of us. That he would not leave us to this mortal existence. He would not leave us to the clutches of sin and death. He would provide a way for the serpent's head to be crushed. And for his purposes for creation to win out. Jesus is our champion, our hero. He overcame the forces of sin and death and rose up to be that tabernacle we were meant to be. And to open the door for all of us in him to attain this for ourselves. But here comes now the question. How can we know the power of that reality now? Because I'll tell you one thing right now, that when I was a boy and I was overwhelmed at that graveyard, I didn't feel it then. It seemed pretty distant to me. How can we know the power of that promise now, in our life, now? Right in the midst of our weakness. Right in the midst of our trials. Our heartaches. Our unfulfilled yearning. How can we know the reality of the risen Christ? The promise of our resurrection in him. How can we know that now? Paul has an answer. And for that, you have to go from the tent to the deposit. (laughs) Our second major word. Maybe that should have been my title, from the tent to the deposit. That's where we go to the deposit And this is, I want to contend that this is actually a major theme in 2 Corinthians. The reality of the Holy Spirit as the deposit or the down payment of the resurrection now in our lives. So that we can, in a very real sense, live in the power of the resurrection now. Feel it. Know it. Claim it. In fact, the Greek word here for this deposit is erebon. It was a down payment. It was a promise. It was a pledge. That's what the word meant in the ancient world. So, for example, if I wanted to buy a house in the ancient world, I would go there and I would tell them, okay, I'll give you a down payment And this down payment was my pledge that I'm going to make payment in full so that I could already take possession of the house. I could already lay claim to it. I can already count it as part of my estate even before I paid the entire thing. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you were bought with a price. God has already claimed you as his tabernacle. He's already taken possession. And he's given you the deposit. He's given you the down payment. And with that down payment, a pledge. That payment will be made in full. And you will enjoy the fullness of this reality. He he mixes the metaphor a little bit. So it's not like God is paying somebody else to take possession of you. He's paying you to take possession of you. (laughs) And in the down payment, you can already experience the fullness of the reality that will come. Paul always takes legal metaphors from his day and twists them to teach his theological truth. And in so doing, 
turns it into something that nobody in the ancient world would have recognized. <laughs> because he's using worldly analogies to describe spiritual truths that are way beyond our comprehension. But what Paul is saying here, this is the upshot of it, that the Holy Spirit in you is the down payment of your resurrection to come. A down payment that actually allows you to experience the wealth to some extent of the riches to come that belong to the risen life. And that down payment carries with it a pledge, a vow, that you will receive payment in full. Living in the power of the Holy Spirit in the here and now is living in the power of the risen life. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of life. It is by the Spirit that Adam, taken from the dust, became a living soul. The Spirit is the Spirit of life. When God breathed forth His Spirit, He renews the ground, it says in Psalm 104. It's the Spirit of life that raised Jesus from the dead. This is God's Spirit. When He breathes that Spirit into any situation, new life is the result. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of resurrection. It's the power by which mortal life is overwhelmed and made immortal. When the Holy Spirit, the down payment of that Spirit comes into your life, you already touch the reality of the resurrection. It already exists in you. You can already feel its power. You can already feel it change you. You are already, already experiencing Something real about the future resurrection. Now, how specifically do we experience this? First of all, I would say in the born again experience. When you become a Christian, you don't just make an intellectual decision to adopt a philosophy of life, you're born anew. You're taken from death to life. I'm, I'm, on, I'm told that in certain places, like for example in China today, it's fashionable for someone to study Christianity as a philosophy of life, like you would study Confucianism. And people will call themselves a Christian because they've studied Christianity as a moral philosophy. And maybe they've given themselves over to it and they believe this moral philosophy of life. Precisely not what we're talking about when we talk about becoming a Christian. Becoming a Christian is being raised. It's being raised up and born anew, awakened to God in a way that in your life is unprecedented. It's like rising up from the dead. Becoming a Christian is like rising up from the dead. Your existence before was given over to the forces of death, given over to the life of the flesh. But when you hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit woos you to accept that, and you accept that, the Spirit comes into you, raises you up, awakens you unto God. It's like a resurrection. It is a resurrection. The born-again experience is already your experience of the resurrection, but spiritually. You're already experiencing it. It's already changing you. Paul makes this very clear. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, Paul says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Already. Made us alive with the risen Christ. Already. Already. In the born-again experience. Paul is describing the born-again experience as being made alive with the risen Christ. We're already participating in his risen life. The resurrection is now. We're already experiencing it to a certain extent. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. 
It is by grace you have been saved. <clears throat> Water baptism <clears throat> is actually a celebration of our resurrection. Many people think of water baptism as simply, you know, dying to self so that you rise up to a life that is dedicated to Christ. And that's true. But it's more than that. Paul makes it clear in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, that if you are baptized into his death, so you shall rise to newness of life, so you shall participate in his resurrection. When you go down in that water and rise up from that water, you are in a very real sense symbolizing your future resurrection. You will be buried one day and you will rise up from the dead. And in that baptism, you are announcing that to everybody who is there. When you see someone baptized, you should celebrate, clap your hands and cheer. Because they are symbolizing their future resurrection. And not just theirs, but yours too. In baptism, you are already proclaiming and laying claim to your future resurrection. Your born-again experience is only the foretaste. You're rising up from spiritual death to spiritual life is only a foretaste of the future resurrection to come when that rising again will be brought to fulfillment because it involves your total existence, both body and soul. We already live in the power of the resurrection. It's very interesting. I, I mentioned earlier that I think this topic of the Spirit as a down payment of the future resurrection to come, that this was a major topic in 2 Corinthians. It is. It's also present, I think, in chapter 4. And this is one of my favorite texts. I've quoted it a few times before. But I think Paul is referring here to the down payment of the Spirit as a treasure hidden in vessels of clay, giving us great power in the here and now to be faithful to Christ in the midst of hardship and suffering. He says here, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And then skip down to verse 11. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us but life is at work in you. And he goes on to say, but we have, but then he goes on to say, verse 8, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. The down payment of the Spirit in us gives us great power. Not only does it raise us up and awaken us to God and allow us to center our lives on Christ rather than on self, the born-again experience, but it continues to give us power in times of weakness and trial and suffering. And it seems like when we feel the weakest, the power is most manifestly present. The power of the Holy Spirit is the power of perseverance and endurance. When you feel like, most like giving up, the power of the Holy Spirit is there to lift you up. You live in the power of the resurrection. And it's not just power to endure, power to go through great suffering, power to persevere. But when we talk about the sanctifying work of the Spirit, when you are born again, the Spirit sanctifies you. The blood of Christ washes away your sins, but you still need to change and become more Christ-like in your thoughts and your desires, more Christ-like in your behavior. And the Spirit will continue 
through his presence in your life to draw you, to lure you, to follow in the way of Christ. The Spirit will continue to make God's word alive to you, a source of great power in your thinking and in your desires. The Spirit will continue to change you and transform you and mold you more and more into the image of Christ. Bear in mind that the body of the resurrection is the perfectly sanctified body. It's a body absolutely pure, completely permeated and led and freed by the Holy Spirit. The body of the resurrection is not corrupt. It's incorruptible. It's not tainted with corruption or sin. It is freed from sin and corruption and the forces of death. The risen body is freed from such things. So as we give ourselves over to the sanctifying power of the Spirit in this life, we experience more and more the liberty of the risen body. We give ourselves over, not only in soul, but also in body, to the sanctifying work of the Spirit, already wanting to manifest now the sanctity of our future body. The Spirit of God in us as a down payment is giving us more and more access to these riches, helping us to experience them more and more as a source of freedom and joy and ecstasy in this life. The resurrection becomes more and more real. We can taste it. We can feel it more and more. And not only in sanctification, but I would like to say even healing, wholeness. I think every divine healing that a person experiences is a sign of the future resurrection. Because the resurrection of the body is the ultimate healing of the body, is it not? Every body will be healed. That's what the resurrection is. The ultimate healing of the body. You tell me about your illnesses and I'll tell you about mine. What I always like to tell whenever I get a new physician, I haven't, I, thank God I've had the privilege of having the same general physician for 20 years. He and I have become good friends. He knows all my problems. <laughs> There's no other person on earth besides my wife who knows my illnesses better than he. He knows them all. And I remember when I went to see him for the first time, I told him I had this colorful garden variety of problems. <laughs> so let me start telling you what they are. The resurrection is the ultimate healing of the body. And I believe that God strategically places those occurrences, those miracles, where someone is healed of something in this life. I think God strategically places those miracles where he wants them in order to edify the body of Christ, in order to... to to proclaim to everyone who can see that this material life is not all there is, that God has promised something more for us, that there is a grand healing of the body yet to come, that the last word at the end of history will not be sickness and death. The last word will be healing and life. If someone is miraculously healed from a disease, that's God telling me that I have reason to hope. And even if I should die of a disease, that person's healing will comfort me. I will go to my death being comforted by that sign that God gave me through that person. Divine healing is not just for the sick person. It's for the body of Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that all the spiritual gifts, including healing, is for the edification of the body. Everyone is to be edified by it. 
My attitude shouldn't be, why was that person healed and I'm not healed? This is not an individualistic prize. Somebody's healing is not just for them. It's for me. It's for you. It's for all of us. It's God giving us a sign of the future resurrection. Giving us a sign that this body is earmarked for something greater. So, I can't tell God where these signs belong, where they should be. We all pray for them. They happen in various degrees in many different ways. God is the supreme strategist. He knows where the signs should be. He knows where they're most needed. And they're wonderful. I look back at my life, and I know of stories of people who have been healed. And those stories make up part of my faith. And as I studied theology, I came to realize more and more what these divine healings really mean, what their purpose is, and I came to appreciate them even more than I ever did before. The resurrection. We can already experience it now. We grow tired. The power of the Holy Spirit gives us the strength we need. We grow weary. We grow discouraged. The power of the Holy Spirit lifts us up. We feel sad. God gives us that inner joy. There's so many ways in which the Spirit of God helps us rise above this mortal existence. I couldn't even begin to list them for you. And all of them point to that time when God's immortal life will swallow up this mortality and lift us up into the image of Jesus, risen and exalted. And that spirit in us now is already giving us a foretaste. When we confess that we believe in the resurrection of the dead, that's not just an empty confession. It's not just a creed. It's not just an intellectual belief. It's not just a a thing that you rationally argue for in apologetics, you know. Prove that Jesus was raised from the dead and you make your arguments. It's not just an intellectual doctrine. It's something you learn to depend on. It's a source of life now in you. Then the more and more you experience it, the less and less distant it seems. And the more you can really, really not only believe it, but feel it. And then comes that deeper assurance more and more. It'll get to the point where you can't even imagine life without resurrection. (laughs) Resurrection is just like The natural conclusion, it it can't end in any other way. Given what I've experienced, given what I've learned to live from, given that power that is always there and always proves faithful, how can life end in any other way? You just become more and more cognizant of the fact that life is earmarked for resurrection. It's what God planned all along. And his spirit in you is bringing that home in deeper and deeper ways. Let me tell you something. If you're um, maybe young in the faith or not that mature in the faith, you haven't experienced in many ways the down payment of the Holy Spirit in your life as the foretaste of the resurrection, 
Let me just encourage you to press on. There's a whole lot more in store for you. And don't settle for anything less. You may, you know, if you have a, like if you have a, a bottle of water, a plastic bottle of water, you may think, well, there's only about that much water in there. I haven't been experiencing all that much spirit. <laughs> all right. Okay. Keep pressing in. When the Spirit lures you, follow. When the Spirit draws you to obey the Word, to hear the Word, to get into the Word, to pray, the Spirit draws you. Listen, follow. Let the Spirit drive you more deeply into this experience of life. You will see that that experience of the Spirit will grow. The resurrection will become, the reality of the future resurrection will become so much more real. Your faith will grow. It'll get to the point where, like I said, you just can't even imagine. You can't even imagine life concluding in any other way than in this way. Let us pray. Lord, we know it says in your word In Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. God, help us to become more acquainted with the spirit of life in us. Help us time and again to be life-affirming not life-denying. Help us yield ourselves to the spirit of new life in all of our life's decisions. To turn away from corruption and death from that which kills and destroys. And to turn towards that which is life-building, life-enhancing, so that we might come to know the reality of the resurrection more powerfully in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.